Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Kraus. And as we continue our introductory analyses of the Greek classics and examining the Greek poetic playwright tradition, we now turn to Sophocles and his contributions to the Greek literary tradition and the great wisdom uh, contained in Sophocles's few surviving plays, uh, which is rather tragic uh, given that uh, Sophocles had won uh, so many awards, yet we only have a uh, half dozen surviving plays of his. Nevertheless, the few plays that we do have are really magnanimous. They are magnificent plays, and all of them are rightly considered uh, classics of the Western literary tradition. Uh, Sophocles, like his slightly younger contemporary Euripides, lived in exciting and transformative times. But where Euripides blasphemously ridiculed the gods and showed their callous cruelty, Sophocles, at least among the handful of plays that have survived, leaves the gods conspicuously absent from his dramas. Instead of the gods being our deliverance, the family is the instrument of salvation and the bulwark against tyranny in his surviving plays, but not without uh, harrowing darkness before ascending to the light. And this is going to be our focus on our introduction to Sophocles. We are primarily going to look at the interplay of family and politics in uh, Oedipus Rex, Antigone, uh, Electra, and uh, Philotectes. So Sophocles was closer to Aeschylus than Euripides in his content and message. Like Aeschylus, Sophocles was also more frequently honored at the festivals and the playwright competitions than the younger and more impetuous tragedian who exposed the hollowness of the dark sacristy of the Athenian pantheon. And we discussed that in our introduction to Euripides. This bears out in his plays where love and filial piety, we're talking about Sophocles now, themes that were present in Aeschylus becomes the major themes in Sophocles. However, unlike Aeschylus, who located filial piety as contingent with the gods, Sophocles located the nexus of filial piety purely between humans. Electra's deliverance with the advent of Orestes or Antigone's breathtaking devotion to Polynesus, which awakens Creon, the ruler of Thebes, to his failures. Even uh, the sympathy of the reader that the reader has for isolated Philotectes all point to the importance of family life in providing uh, meaning, comfort, and civilizational stability in Sophocles' work. Beyond filial piety and deliverance, the other great theme that concerned Sophocles was the tyranny of the state. And again, they actually seem to go hand in hand. They are dialectically paired with each other. Creon embodies a status tyranny in Antigone. Even pitiable Oedipus is the strong man of the state in Oedipus Rex, going as far as boldly eulogizing himself as the ruin or the wretched man that saved the state. Clytemnestra and Aegisthus in Electra are equally status agents who are interested in the lust for power that characterizes the naked reality of human politics, unless you're some starry-eyed idealist. Athens had slipped from the open democracy that it was when she led the defense of Greece against the Persians. Though the Athenian delegates in Pericles and Pericles in Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War proclaim in an open-air forum the greatness of Athens, the greatness was waning prior to the war and certainly exacerbated itself during the conflict when Sophocles was uh, composing his late plays. The backdrop to the tragedy of Electra is the Trojan War, a war uh, in its brutality every bit the equivalent of the ongoing Peloponnesian War that was dominating the life of Sophocles. Likewise, Philotectes has the Trojan War as its immediate context. 
uh, Philotectes was written during the final decade of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, we should know that uh, when you read that play. The loneliness and desolation and the desolate isolation that Philotectes embodies is the same loneliness and isolation that drove Clytemnestra to plot uh, to kill Agamemnon. The difference being that Philotectes was uh, somewhat comically and mercilessly abandoned for his smelly foot and left for dead on an island all alone. Philotectes survived, uh, but is taken advantage of by returning Greek heroes, including Odysseus and Neoptolemus. Poor Philotectes, however, is robbed of a life, a family, and the happy ideal life with others. In this respect, Sophocles is amending the same wisdom imparted to the world from the pen of Homer and Aeschylus. Love, especially as directed to the family or for family, is what makes life worth living in the pathological, rage-filled, dark cosmos that the ancient Greeks inhabited. That filial love, however, was rapidly dissipating during the time of Sophocles, and this is what caused Euripides to present, I think, love as, quote, a dangerous thing. Sophocles lived through the rise and decline of filial piety, which corresponded, in his mind, with the rise and decline of Athens. It would be wrong to maintain that Sophocles, or any of the Greeks for that matter, had an understanding of natural law in the same way that scholastic medieval Christians did, or that we do now, having been the inheritors of that tradition. In fact, reading back onto the Greeks, the high moral law is, ironically, part of the Christian inheritance of Western civilization. Apart from Aristotle and Cicero, especially Cicero, it is hard to ascertain anything resembling uh, St. Thomas Aquinas's uh, Thuma, Summa Theologiae and its rumin, uh, ruminations on the natural law, which was also developed through centuries of Catholic thinking and encyclicals. Nevertheless, we do see the faint glimpses of the natural law in Sophocles, which was more fully developed, if we can say that, than in Aristotle and Cicero, who still pale in comparison to their Catholic successors. And so again, sometimes you get people who say, well, the Greeks seem to have had a concept of natural law. Uh, many uh, conservative Catholics and Orthodox Jews who are involved in the classics uh, seem to suggest this. Uh, I don't necessarily dispute that if we mean we can see some trace of the natural law Again, in Aristotle, in Cicero, in some of the Greek playwrights, especially Sophocles, you can kind of see it in Plato as well. But it certainly isn't, again, the fully developed natural law philosophy that you get out of the Christian tradition, which I think is what most people generally mean when they say the Greeks had uh, an understanding of natural law uh, compared to what? Uh, the Christian tradition, if you're comparing it to Christian natural law, uh, there really is no comparison. The Greeks were far beneath what the medieval scholastics uh, wrote about concerning the natural law. The closest revelation to Sophocles' natural law, if we can say that, and the centrality of the family to it comes through the person of Creon, however, especially as connected through Oedipus Rex, Rex and Antigone. Again, I do think you see an aspect of the natural law in Sophocles, but it is very dim, but it is the dimness which actually makes uh, reading the natural law in Sophocles uh, so remarkable. Uh, patricide and incest are objects of shame in Oedipus Rex. Such, uh, such crimes, though Oedipus is fated by the gods to commit such heinous acts, are the focus of scorn from Sophocles' pen. Blinded and ashamed, Oedipus prepares to leave Thebes but not without talking to Creon one last time. In the final dialogue between Oedipus and Creon, Oedipus implores Creon to nurture Antigone and his mene and blesses him before his exile. Prior to this touching moment, the closest thing to a resolution in the play Oedipus Rex, Oedipus was filled with pride and the lust for power. Accompanied by Jocasta, his 
mother whom he took as a wife, the two coldly assert that to be liberated from one's parents makes one happy. Moreover, we are informed that Oedipus's foster father, uh, Polybus, loved him and loved him ever so dearly. Upon hearing the news of his supposed father's death, Oedipus cruelly rejoices, which exposes his hollowness. You were a gift. He took you from my arms, the shepherd messenger tells Oedipus. A gift, Oedipus retorts, but he loved me as his own. The messenger replies, he had no children of his own to love. Jocasta, overhearing the conversation, is overcome with guilt and shame and leaves to commit suicide off stage. Oedipus and Jocasta had mocked the gods and scorned fathers and mothers in their lust for self-power and gain. Although we know the gods had faded them to misery, one cannot help but feel a certain rage at, bo at both in celebrating the death of parents. Their celebratory emptiness was their choosing, and that's the important part here. Sophocles seems to hint at which makes their crimes worse than if they had simply played out the lot that fate had dealt them. As such, the family is utterly destroyed, except for Antigone and his mene, uh, who mature under Creon's watchful and loving arms. And so here you see the same thing that Euripides actually deals with. It is who takes responsibility for actions, the gods or humans. Sophocles in this respect, with Euripides, conclude against Aeschylus that it is humans who must take responsibility for the things that occur. So Oedipus and Jocasta could have simply had uh, accepted the lot that the gods had dealt them and not celebrated the death of uh, Oedipus's uh, foster parents, but instead they do celebrate the death, the news of the death of Oedipus's foster parents, which exposes the hollowness and the emptiness of both of them. Their choice to celebrate the news of such terrible, uh, terrible circumstances really shows what truly moved them. However, in Antigone, with Creon suffering from political challenges, his relationship with Antigone changes for the worse. He contemns Antigone for wanting to bury the body of her traitorous uh, brother. Creon had decreed civically that none of the enemies of Thebes are to be honored. Polynesus is to be left on the bloodstained field of battle, his body to be the food of vultures for his rebelliousness. Antigone, by contrast, affirms the law of filial love and wanting to bury the dead body of her brother. And burial was one of the most important uh, of rights in ancient Greek society. Creon and the loving, not necessarily strong world, as usually interpreted, Antigone come to crossing blows over how to uh, react to the death of Polynices. Creon had as ordered with the authority of the state and law to let traitors rot and be consumed by rats and vultures. Antigone, on the other side, exhibits the spirit of love to bury the body of her brother in a dignified grave. Creon's tyrannical actions sever his bond with Antigone. Ismene's submission to civic tyranny instead of the moral law equally destroys her relationship with her sister. It is not until Antigone and Haman flee to the culling fields to bury and honor Polynesus, thus making themselves enemies of the state in the process, that Creon, in his loneliness, realizes his errors. He cries out as if to the heavens, In the end it is the ancient codes, O oh, my regrets, that one must keep to value life then one must value law. Creon's tearful statement is ironic. The law he associates with life is not the civil law he had been forcibly uh, promoting, but the moral law of the family which brings and nurtures life. He rushes to the field too late. Antigone and Haman are both dead. Creon realizes his sins and repents. But the tragedy has come full gale though we have learned something important from Creon's claim that to value life, one must keep those ancient codes 
of filial piety. So despite the tragedy, uh, Sophocles is imparting tremendous wisdom to us in the midst of darkness. In the midst of Sophocles' works is the struggle between family and state tyranny. Aristotle maintained that family served as the basis of all civilization. Aristotle wasn't on to something new. He was restating something ancient, which had been forgotten in Athens's descent into imperialism and eventually tyranny. And starting over, Aristotle began again with the basics. As they say, you must begin with the basics. The Athens of Sophocles' time was a morally degenerate and anti-filial place. The place of family in Athenian life had been dethroned. The dissolution of family and the crisis of agnatic relationships are not only visibly uh, presented in the tragedians, they are also the focus of the comedic wit and comedy by Aristophanes in The Wasps. Likewise, Plato treats the subject of the dissolution of filial bonds and the supremacy of the state in his dialogues, especially the Euthyphro and Crito. In calling for a return to the ancient codes, Sophocles was advocating a return to the stability and order of the family as the most effective buttress against state power and the chaos unleashed in a society uh, obsessed with self-pursuit and power, which ultimately destroyed Athens in the Peloponnesian War. Electra is the great play, which showcases the theme of filial deliverance. Electra has been living under the tyranny of her mother, Clytemnestra, and her adulterous lover, Aegisthus. She is alone and tormented. She loathes her mother for her actions and doesn't consider Clytemnestra her mother based on her actions. No mother would murder her husband and coldly celebrate the news of the death of her son, Orestes. Deviating from his great master and teacher, Sophocles rewrites Electra's deliverance. Aeschylus had Electra meet Orestes at the tomb of Agamemnon in the Libation Bearers. Electra fully knows of Orestes uh, and his plan to execute vengeance or justice, depending on your perspective, upon Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. In Sophocles' version, our heart agonizes and weeps for Electra. She is abused and distraught. When Clytemnestra celebrates the news of the death of Orestes, Electra proclaims that her world has been taken from her and that she has no will or reason left to live. It is a very sad and tragic moment that stirs the soul of any reader. Did the callous woman cry and mourn for her dead son? Was there an ounce of grief or pain? Not a bit. She left us laughing. Oh, my poor dearest Orestes, you have snuffed my life out by your death, Electra bitterly cries. Her cries are a testament of her love. Without family and suffering, the burden of, and suffering the burden of tyranny, Electra informs us that life is unbearable. This is she, a most unhappy woman. She weeps in front of Orestes, not yet knowing that it is he, Orestes, in seeing his sister in the state of agony, is moved to pity, a testament of his love for her. I cannot bear to think of your wretched, unwedded life, he says. In this exchange, Sophocles is telling us that uh, life without a family is miserable, but it is also indicating that life with a family is plentiful and joyful. When Orestes reveals himself to Electra, she is moved to joy and bliss, knowing that her brother is still alive. O oh, day of bliss, she proclaims, pure bliss indeed, Orestes lovingly answers. Love, family, and deliverance are all bound up together in Electra. The love of a brother and a sister, the reunification of a family torn apart by murder and the lust for power, brings about not only earthly uh, deliverance in the form of blissful joy, but also deliverance from the hand of cruel and petty political power. Electra is not a tragedy like Oedipus Rex or Antigone. 
Electra is a play of deliverance and the triumph of the bonds of love that come through the tribulations of tragedy. Unlike in Aeschylus, there is no indication that Orestes kills Clytemnestra and Aegisus out of fidelity to the gods. Instead, he is an oracle of reckoning and an angel of deliverance. The real story is not revenge or justice. It is, in my opinion, Electra's liberation, her salvation, if you will, and her liberation from the tyranny under which she suffers. This takes love and family, according to Sophocles. Without love and family, life is truly unbearable, as Electra states in the play. With the arrival of Orestes, love and the reconstitution of a family bring deliverance and the end of tyranny. One can only hope that life with others, with a family, is that which also awaits Philotectes as he leaves his Robinson Crusoe-like state of existence behind him. If Aeschylus saw strife and love being superseded by persuasion and justice through the ancient divinities, and if Euripides exposed the hollowness of those divinities that Aeschylus piously venerated, Sophocles offered the modus vivendi between the two. And again, it's important to remember that the late Sophocles, of which uh, many of his surviving plays were composed, were in a time when Euripides was also writing. After all, Aristophanes pits Aeschylus and Euripides against each other in the frogs, but in that play, Aeschylus favors Sophocles, not Euripides, as his heir apparent, as he says in the frogs that when he is away to resurrect and save Athens, let Sophocles sit on my throne, not Euripides. While Aeschylus offers a vision of laboring with gods for a better world of reason and justice, and while Euripides seems to suggest that man alone is in control of his fate and actions, Sophocles humanizes the hopeful vision of Aeschylus. The gods are never central characters in Sophocles' drama in the way that they were in Aeschylus. The gods are conspicuously absent, again, at least in the plays that have survived for posterity. Instead, we see love and deliverance between humans. The gods remain at a distance. Sophocles, then, was a traditionalist and a humanist. Sophocles understood the place of love and the family as the cornerstone of civilization and the good life, thus standing in stark contrast to the dangerous love of Euripides. The dissipation of the family had led to the forgetting of those ancient codes and way of life that makes civic life possible and fruitful. When the family dies or disintegrates, state tyranny emerges to take its place. And that probably sounds familiar uh, to many people today. Yet Sophocles' advocacy rests on filial piety instead of divine piety. Moreover, and more scandalously, if not otherwise darkly, redemption in Sophocles is born only in and through tragedy. Without tragedy, there can be no redemption. We must plunge into the abyss of death and tyranny before being lifted out, out of the darkness. The light in Sophocles is surrounded by a cesspool of blood, corruption, and murder. Indeed, the light flows out of the drowning darkness of gore, revenge, and sorrow. Sophocles was not sacrilegious or irreligious in the same way that Euripides was. He honored the gods like a good Athenian, yet he didn't seem to think, as Aeschylus did, that the gods are integral players in human development and deliverance. That he left to us. In some respects, a world where we are responsible for moral action and loving deliverance is just as daunting and haunting a prospect as standing before Athena and Apollo in trial and being melded to be a co-laborer with reason and justice. The light is brightest when it is surrounded by the darkest cloud trying to suffocate it. And the light of Sophocles shines ever so brightly in the darkness ensnaring it. To journey and stand at the top of Mount Parnassus is a gritty and grisly struggle. Despite the darkness surrounding us in this journey, 
Sophocles guides us up the mountain with a dim light, only to reveal a grander light at its peak. So as you can see, Sophocles, I think, is one of the more mature of the uh, playwrights. His surviving plays deals with some of the eternal themes of politics, civilization, family, and love. And as you can see from this lecture in our introduction to Sophocles, Sophocles is concerned with the dissolution of the family that had hit Athens at the end of the 5th century and the tyranny that Athens had, fall, had uh, fallen into as a result. From Sophocles' surviving writings, especially his late plays, we see Sophocles connect tyranny with the dissolution of the family, and we also see that the overthrow of tyranny is through the restoration of the family.